Agora ele Pode ajudar, por favor. Alguém comentar aí? Quero. Professor of Philosophy at the University of Warwick. The focus of his studies uh, and his academic production has been Hegel's philosophy in general, and in particular, science of logic and phenomenology of spirit. Um, let me mention the book, uh, The Opening of Hegel's Logic, uh, The Hegel Reader, and the articles Necessity and Contingency in the Science of Logic, Hegel's Critic of Foundationalism, in, um, and um, Thinking philosophically without begging the question, and the chapter Phenomenology of Spirit in the Black and White Guide to Continental Philosophy. He also published it on Hegel's Philosophy of Nature, uh, the collected book on Hegel and Philosophy of Nature, 1989, on Hegel's Philosophy of Art, uh, Hegel's Philosophy of Religion, and Philosophy of Rights. But he also uh, wrote articles on Kant, Nietzsche, Derrida, Schelling, among other philosophers. So you already started uh, these two debates with John McDowell, uh, one concerning the interpretation uh, of the chapter of the self-consciousness in the phenomenology of spirit, and the other one concerning the notion of experience and how experience is related to thought. Today, uh, he will give a presentation entitled uh, Hegel McDowell Perceptual Experience, a second attempt, which I presume will be a continuation of the second debate I mentioned. So please, first of all, Good, well, are you okay? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, ready? Uh, right, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the, um, for the invitation here. It's a delight uh, to be here. Um, yeah, is that all right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I really hate these things, sorry. So I try to avoid them as best as possible. Um, uh, anyway, so thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you particularly to uh, Andre and, and Federico and the others for, for organizing this. And, and making it such uh, an easy journey uh, from, from England to Brazil. So I really appreciate uh, all you've done. Um, in 2006, I published an essay uh, that set out what I took to be the principal similarities and differences between Hegel and McDowell concerning perceptual experience. Uh, McDowell replied with some appreciative, uh, but also critical remarks. And I would like to take this occasion to respond belatedly to his criticisms. To do so, however, I need once more to explain Hegel's conception of perceptual experience. Uh, and my account is again based on Hegel's Encyclopedia of Philosophy of Spirit uh, and accompanying lectures, some of which uh, that you may or may not know have actually been published uh, since my essay uh, and John's reply were, um, were published. Um, now, I, do, I have to apologize that uh, some of this will be uh, familiar. Uh, particularly, uh, I have to apologize to John, although he has set my mind at rest by just saying that he has uh, hasn't reread the old exchange, which is which is which is good. So maybe some of this will be uh, fresh. Like Kant, Hegel recognizes that mature human perception does not just entail opening one's eyes and letting the world in, but involves what McDowell calls conceptual capacities. In such perception, therefore, sensation, that is external sensation, cooperates with thought. So let's first consider the distinctive contribution made by sensation in Hegel's view. External sensations for Hegel are ways in which parts of the body, its sensory organs, are affected by other things and by other parts of the body. Yet they are not just modifications of the body, but rather such modifications as they are felt by what Hegel calls the soul. Sensations are thus forms of sensory awareness. These sensations, however, have specific characteristics. First, they are how the soul finds itself to be determined, or modifications of our own subjectivity. Second, they are how the soul finds itself to be determined, and are not produced by the subject itself. This is because, 
as just noted, they arise through the bodies being affected by other things. The consciousness of being affected by something else is not, however, itself part of the sensation. But the latter is simply an immediate determination of the soul. By the way, I should add here, Hegel's not just pulling this out of the air. It's not just something he happened to make up on a Saturday morning. This is derived, but I'm, I'm just giving you, as it were, the bare bones uh, story for the purpose of this presentation. Immediacy constitutes the form of each sensation, but different kinds of sensation have different kinds of content. Visual sensation, Hegel states, is the awareness of a plane of colors, Fläche von Farbigen. Such colors are in turn, for the philosopher, though not for the soul itself, the way things in the world manifest themselves. Under the right conditions, therefore, vision takes in the manifestness, manifestiert sein, or the look of things themselves, though colors are also partly conjured up by the eye, Hegel says. Yet in Hegel's view, vision does not see any depth to things or locate them at a distance from us. This does not mean, however, that space is wholly absent from visual sensation. For we see space in seeing a two-dimensional plane of colors. And in this respect, Hegel's conception of sensation differs from that of Kant. For Kant, famously, there's nothing of space or time in sensations themselves, since space and time are the a priori forms of sensibility. For Hegel, by contrast, the determinacies of time and space belong to sensation itself. We see space, however, only in the physical form of light or an expanse of color. Touch differs from vision by feeling shape in its three dimensions. Like Bishop Barclay, however, Hegel argues that we can learn to see depth and distance by comparing and combining visual and tactile sensations, such as a shadow and a felt shape. Note that this ability to see in three dimensions must be acquired. And in that sense, I quote, the child must learn to see, zeal them. Vision in a more concrete sense, therefore, is not just passive and receptive, but involves an operation on the part of the subject. Yet the comparing and combining of sensations is not freely initiated by us, nor does it require thought or concepts, since it is something of which animals, as well as humans, must be capable, and for Hegel, animals can't think. What enables us to see depth and distance is simply our habit, Gewohnheit, of associating visual and tactile sensations with one another. Hegel argues, however, that mature human perception is more than just sensation and as such involves thought, the initial form of which is consciousness. Concrete vision sees colors stretching away from us, but it doesn't take what we see to be an object distinct from the subject. Consciousness, by contrast, does precisely that. Consciousness for Hegel does not add to the content of our awareness, since, quote, everything is in sensation. It rather confers a form on what we see that is absent from the sensation itself, the form of being there, of being something over against the knowing subject. The content of sensation already has the form of immediacy, insofar as it is simply given to and found by the soul. Consciousness, however, takes what we see to be something standing apart from us, to be, I quote, a being, a something, an existing thing, an individual, and so on. As Hegel puts it, therefore, the sensation of red is a determination of the soul. But that the red is something red, etwas rotes, is the object objectivity of consciousness. Hegel insists that there are no distinct objects for sensation as such, but just colors, sounds, or felt shapes. For the animal, therefore, he writes, there is no something, no thing. There are things and objects only for a conscious eye, ich. Moreover, the eye is conscious of itself as an eye. Consequently, I quote, only when I come to apprehend myself as I, does the other become an object for me, confront me. This in turn means not just that 
the I think must be able to accompany all my representations as Kant states, but that there is no consciousness of objects without actual self-consciousness, at least to some degree. Consciousness is thus conscious of objects and conscious of itself as conscious of them. Now consciousness for Hegel is a form of thought and as such, unlike the habit of seeing death, is free and active, though it can become habitual. More precisely, consciousness actively separates from itself and expels in Ausfield the content of sensation and thereby sets, zetzt it outside itself as an object. I quote, the reflection of the soul into itself, I, separates aptet, this material, from itself and gives it the determination of being. In so doing, Hegel claims, consciousness engages in a twofold act of judgment, urteil. Distinguishing an object from itself is itself an act of original division, urteilen. And that act, in turn, involves identifying the object, at least tacitly, as such and such, and judging it to be, for example, a red rose. Yet, despite the fact that it is active, consciousness for Hegel is not aware that it is. To consciousness, therefore, the object appears not as an object posited by the eye, but as an immediate given object that just is. And consciousness takes itself simply to be the subject for which objects are present. Consciousness thus has an unconscious side to it and does not share the understanding that philosophy has of it. And just to throw in, for those of you interested in Hegel's aesthetics, you will know that the unconscious side to consciousness is something that uh, occupies Hegel in his analysis of Oedipus Rex. So to recapitulate, vision considered by itself simply finds itself aware of a plane of colors, though it also learns to see depth. In mature human beings, however, vision never occurs by itself, but is always a moment of the consciousness of objects. Such consciousness equally just finds itself in the presence of objects, but it is in fact the unconscious activity of setting what we see over against us as a sphere of objects. Hegel identifies three forms of such consciousness, the first of which is just sensuous consciousness, that just takes what it sees to be an immediately given thing subject to change. The second is perception, which takes things not just to be there, but to be a manifold of relations, universalities, that is to be a thing with multiple properties. And the third is understanding, verstand, which takes things to be governed by laws. All three forms are integral to our consciousness of being in Hegel's view, but only with perception and understanding does consciousness become perceptual experience, erfahrung, of the world. No, excuse me. Note that each form of consciousness goes beyond sensation and employs concepts and categories to think of what we see as objective and thereby to set it over against us. Concepts such as being, something, property, and law. These concepts constitute what Hegel calls the metaphysics that informs and makes possible perceptual experience of the world. Nonetheless, in each of its forms, the focus of consciousness is on the object before it rather than itself. Its concepts enable it to comprehend what we see as an object, or in Kantian terms, as a synthetic unity. Consciousness is conscious of itself as an I, and as perception and understanding, it knows that it employs concepts. Yet it takes itself to do no more than disclose what the object is, the object in its truth. Consciousness is not aware that it actively posits or constructs the object it encounters. And I should note that Hegel uses the word construction, construction in the lectures that have been recently uh, published, which is uh, interesting given the uh, Tom's paper. Now, in a remarkable statement in his 1825 lectures, Hegel admits that his conception of consciousness as positing its objects coincides with that of subjective idealism, the position he otherwise attributes to Kant and subjects to criticism. Hegel insists, however, I quote, that this subjective idealism is only one side of philosophy, of true idealism. 
we do indeed cast sensory content outside us through our activity. But the objects we encounter are not merely the products of our activity. To say that, Hegel insists, would be as irrational as maintaining that things are just given to us and we are quite inactive. The truth is that thought and consciousness are the unity of subjectivity and objectivity. There are two senses in which consciousness for Hegel does not confine us within a merely subjective idealism. First, as we've seen, visual, visual sensation, though not for the soul itself, is the awareness of the way external things manifest themselves. Sensation is thus already more than just subjective, but brings to mind features of the world out there. For Kant, by contrast, sensation acquaints us with, I quote Kant, nothing except our way of perceiving, which is peculiar to us. Now, although for Hegel consciousness actively, if unconsciously, posits sensory content as objective, the categories through which it does so are not the arbitrary products of thought, but are inherent in and made necessary by thought. They constitute the necessary determinations of free thought, and so lay down how objects must be thought by every consciousness in which the categories have, as it were, dawned. <coughs> This then appears to be the second sense in which consciousness does not confine us within a subjective idealism. It, its categories lay down what objectivity must be thought to be. Yet, if, of course, Kant could say the same thing, since for him too categories are the necessary a priori forms that determine how objects must be thought. They are the conditions under which, I quote Kant, every intuition must stand in order to become an object for me and for any other discursive intellect. Indeed, Hegel gives Kant credit for equating objectivity with what categories require us to think. It is in this sense, Hegel states, that Kant called what conforms to thought, das Gedankenmäßige, objective. And he was certainly right to do this. Hegel criticizes Kant, however, for reducing such objectivity to subjective objectivity and thereby defending a subjective idealism. Kant does so, in Hegel's view, because he draws a sharp distinction between thought and the thing in itself, which Hegel equates with what the thing truly is. For Hegel, then, we do not avoid subjective idealism just by identifying what thought makes necessary with objectivity. We do so only when we also recognize that through thought, we bring before our minds being itself. As just noted, Hegel takes Kant's concept of the thing in itself to refer to what things really are in themselves. That is, he conflates the thing in itself with being. This, however, is a subtle misunderstanding on, Kant, on Hegel's part. Kant's concept of the thing in itself does not refer to some being just out of reach, but is produced by thought as the correlate of the idea that objects of experience are appearances. As Kant puts it, I quote Kant, the understanding when it calls an object in a relation mere phenomenon simultaneously makes for itself, sich macht, beyond this relation, another representation of an object in itself. Yet Kant puts being or existence itself beyond thought in his critique of the ontological argument. In his view, thought judges things to exist or to be such and such, but it can't do so on the basis of concepts alone. I quote Kant, whatever and however much our concept of an object may contain, we have to go out beyond it in order to provide it with existence. And this, of course, is why the mere concept of God cannot prove, prove the existence of God uh, in Kant's mind. So even though Hegel mistakenly conflates Kant's thing in itself with being, he's right to insist that thought alone for Kant cannot bring being or existence to mind. In Kant's view, thought is not itself a form of intuition. But as he puts it in the third critique, concepts deal with the mere possibility of an object. An object is judged actually to be there only when it's given insensible intuition. Such intuition, however, 
has subjective, though for humans, universal conditions, namely the forms of intuition. The objects we judge to exist and to be such and such are therefore no more than appearances. Now, in contrast to Kant, Hegel thinks that space and time belongs to things themselves, and that in sensation we see and hear space and time that have become physical as color and sound. Hegel also contends that thought is indeed the intuition of being, being that is irreducible to its being thought by us. For Hegel, as for Spinoza, Thought is not primarily distinct from being, but it is itself being. The categories inherent in thought are thus inherent in being itself. Moreover, thought itself knows this, unless it's Kantian. I quote, it knows that what is thought is, and that what is only is insofar as it is thought. Thought therefore not only knows that there are things or objects in the world, but through its categories, it knows things themselves in their being. Now, it remains the case that thought as consciousness actively sets its sensory content over against it as an independent object. Yet, when such content allows itself to be thought in this way, and we are thus not misconceiving what we see, consciousness thinks what it sees to be the object it actually is. The activity of consciousness renders the object itself present to us. Two things, however, need to be emphasized. First, our thinking of what we see as being an object is not founded on or justified by what we see, because the content of sensation itself contains no element of being an object or of being categorically structured at all. Our conceiving of what we see as an object is justified by thoughts, knowing that there are objects. Sensory content must certainly allow itself to be conceived as an object. And if it does not do so, we must understand it differently. If part of this tree suddenly tweaks and takes flight, then it is not in fact part of this tree. Sensuous consciousness of things is thus always open to the possibility of revision. Nonetheless, thought answers to itself not just a sensation, in judging there to be objects before it. Second, thought does not somehow take in a thing's being, thinghood, or objectivity, in the way the soul takes in the colors and shapes of things. Thought sets what we see over against us as a being and a thing. Yet in so doing, Hegel claims, thought actively thinks what we see to be the object it is. As Hegel puts it, I quote, our activity is one side, but equally the other side is that the object also is. Das der Gegenstand auch ist. That is why, for Hegel, the activity of consciousness in positing a world of objects does not confine us within subjective idealism. Okay, so sensation and consciousness for Hegel are both required for perceptual experience, but they do not exhaust the latter. Hegel argues that theoretical spirit or intelligence is also needed. Indeed, intelligence is the whole within which both sensation and consciousness are moments. So I leave it to you to decide whether I fall more on the descriptivist or the reconstructive side. I'm descriptivist in that I like to trace each one separately, but here obviously we were reconstructivist in that they all belong uh, together. In intelligence, in Hegel's view, is more explicitly self-consciousness, uh, more, more explicitly self-conscious, sorry, than either the soul or consciousness. It is thus aware, as consciousness is not, or at least it can become aware, of its own activity. And this activity, which Hegel calls attention, aufmerksamkeit, is that of directing oneself towards the content of sensation. And it has two sides to it. On the one hand, attending to what we see entails distinguishing the latter from us or moving it away, wegrücken, as an independent being. And in this sense, Hegel says, it too is an act of judgment. On the other hand, it entails bringing what we see within the space of our own awareness and thereby filling oneself with a content. So as we attend to things, we ourselves become absorbed in them 
and such absorbed awareness of things Hegel calls intuition or hunch. Now, attention for Hegel is not just a habit or an unconscious act of mind, but it depends on my willfulness, my willkür, on my deliberate effort. I quote, I'm attentive, he says, only when I will to be so, just as a human being stands, only insofar as he wills to stand. Yet Hegel also includes attention and intuition in what he calls the concrete habit of seeing. If a child is to see more than a plane of colors, therefore, he must develop not only the will to attend to what is before him, but also the habit of willing, die Gewohnheit des Willens. Attention, however, remains something we can suspend if we want to. If you open your eyes, you can fail to see what is visible. But you can let your eyes go out of focus and thereby lose a clear sense of depth. <coughs> At least I can, maybe because I'm short-sighted, but uh, it is possible. Whereas consciousness takes what it sees to be a distinct object or thing with properties, intelligence, as intuition and, uh, and attention, casts the content of sensation out into space and time. We've seen that the soul is already aware of space and time in a physical form, namely as the plane of colors and the occurring of sound. So space and time in that sense must be present for consciousness too. Intuition, however, sets things in a space and time that is a continuity or universality in its own right. Such universality, Hegel states, is formal and contentless, and as such distinct from the sensory content. Intuition is aware, therefore, not just of extended colors and disappearing sounds, but of things in space and time. Furthermore, intuition posits both space and time as a totality. Space, therefore, does not just belong to things that stand over against me, but it is a space that surrounds us and within which things are located. So to intuit something as being here or occurring now is to set it in a space or time that continues beyond whatever is directly present to us. Hegel states unequivocally that intelligence in the form of intuition is an activity of spirit. I quote, the content of intuition is a first a felt content, but intelligence is active in it, is in ihr Aktion. For intelligence has shaped, formiert, this content. And this formation is the spatial and the temporal. Yet, like consciousness, intuition posits things to be what they are in themselves. Since, as we know from the philosophy of nature, things are themselves spatial and temporal. Moreover, intuition itself takes things to be spatio-temporal themselves. As Hegel puts it, and I quote, things are spatial and temporal because they are posited as external by spirit. Spirit does this two things. Der Geist tut dies den Dingen an. And this is no subjective activity of spirit as in Fichte, but it is the nature of things themselves. Hegel's conception of space, time, and intuition thus differs in two respects from that of Kant, even though he agrees that space and time are a priori. First, Space and time for Kant are forms of our receptivity and not the result of our subjective activity. They're simply the forms in which objects are given to us, although not as objects, since that requires concept. Second, since space and time are a priori, they cannot, in Kant's view, belong to things in themselves and so must be purely subjective, though universal among human beings. As Kant puts it, no determinations can be intuited by the subject prior to the existence of the things to which they pertain. What we do intuit prior to things thus cannot belong to the latter and so must belong solely to the subject. And implicit in this claim is a further one, endorsed by empiricists, that we can know something of things themselves only from those things a priori, a claim that Kant makes explicitly in paragraph 9 of the Prolegomena. For Hegel, by contrast, there is nothing unintelligible in the idea that the subject can confer a priori on what it sees, the very form that belongs to things themselves. 
So, perceptual experience, as Hegel conceives it, requires a given sensory content, the unconscious activity of consciousness, and the more deliberate act of attention that opens up a whole space of things and that has itself become habitual. In his 1825 lectures, however, Hegel indicates that even more is required. In an act of seeing, he states, there are many representations that are, quote, first acquired through a great amount of reflection. Furthermore, he notes, a child who is learning to see is also learning language. Hegel suggests, therefore, that the concrete habit of seeing, as opposed to mere vision as such, requires beyond intuition the ability to form general representations, to speak, and also to reflect and think. This suggestion is confirmed by Hegel, Hegel's claim that the educated person, the gebildete, sees more or discerns more in what he sees than the uneducated person. I'll leave it up to you whether that's right, but that's what you think. <laughs> in Hegel's view, then, the explicit activity of thinking and judging works with consciousness and intuition to render intelligible what we see. This is not to deny that there is a difference for Hegel between the intellectually structured seeing of the tree and the thoughts we have and judgments we make about the tree. This difference is implicit in his claim that intelligence reconstructs intuitions, representations uh, into thoughts. And there should be a quotation mark before the reconstructs. Yet, according to Hegel, we would not be capable of such structured seeing or at least not much beyond the level of a child, if we did not also engage in explicit thought and judgment, judgment that is, of course, often a matter of habit. And in this respect, it seems to me, Hegel is very close to Kant. For Kant, there is a difference between understanding the manifold of intuition to be a synthetic unity through categories, and subsuming representations under a, a concept in a judgment. Nonetheless, the function that gives unity to the synthesis of, synthesis of representations in an intuition is the same function as that which gives unity to different representations in a judgment. This is because categories, I quote, are nothing other than these very functions for judging, insofar as the manifold of a given intuition is determined with regard to them. Moreover, the understanding can conceive of intuitions as a synthetic unity and thus as an object, only insofar as at the same time it judges the object to be this or that. Parche McDowell, at least as I understand him, it is not just that the ability to enjoy intuitions is inseparable from the ability to make judgments, but enjoying intuitions requires actually making judgments. The distinct activities of categorizing and judging must occur together. Why? This is because categories, as well as being thoughts of synthetic unity, are also concepts, and thus are predicates of possible judgments, and so must be employed in judgments. For Kant, therefore, as for Hegel, judgments are not only based on our categorized intuitions, but they are also conditions of the latter. For it is in judging what we see to be such and such, that we also unite what we see into the intuition of an object. They, they go together. Indeed, in Kant's view, not only is judgment required for perceptual experience of objects, but so too is reason. For without reason's transcendental principle of homogeneity, or the law of genera, I quote Kant, no empirical concepts, and hence no experience would be possible. Hegel and Kant have different views about space and time, and about the relation between thought and being. Nonetheless, they agree that thought plays an indispensable role in making perceptual experience possible. Moreover, they agree in a further respect. Both take us to be passive and receptive insofar as we are sensory beings, and insist that sensory receptivity as such does not involve the spontaneity or activity of thought. Equally, however, they insist that in mature human beings, sensation is inseparable from the consciousness of objects, and that sensory content cannot enter consciousness without the activity of thought. 
activity that is itself partly unconscious and partly conscious. So for Hegel and Kant, perceivers are engaged in the activity of conceiving as they receive sensations, if not in sensory receptivity itself. Now, in my earlier essay, I wrote that understanding is irreducibly operative in receptivity. This does not mean, however, that understanding itself enables us to see colors or feel shapes. Rather, I quote, conceptual capacities are drawn into operation in receptivity in the sense that nothing is received into the conscious mind without their operation. That's me quoting my earlier essay. In mature human beings, however, no sensory content is received without being received or rather taken up into consciousness. Except, of course, that which remains unconscious and plays no role in perceptual experience. Conceptual capacities are thus operative, with the exception just noted, whenever we receive sensations at all, and in that sense are operative in receptivity, within, in inverted commas. Yet their operation consists in actively conferring objectivity on sensuous con sensory content. But it's precisely this idea that McDowell rejects, even though he shares the Kantian Hegelian view that experience involves conceiving as well as seeing. Now, in response to my earlier essay, McDowell notes that in Mind and World, he did not deny, as I took him to, that there is, I quote, a notional distinction between sensibility and understanding. As McDowell puts it, sensory responsiveness on its own does not enable its possessors to think. The capacity of thought on its own does not provide for sensory responsiveness to features of the environment. McDowell describes this distinction as Kantian, and I am happy to accept that he draws it. The distinction is also drawn by Hegel. For Hegel, however, the fact that sensibility does not enable its possessors to think means that it does not provide any thought or consciousness of objects, and that the latter is provided only by thought or consciousness itself. In sensory experience, therefore, in which sensibility and thought cooperate, thought gives sensory content a form that that content does not itself have, maybe that of being an object. Yet McDowell rejects this last claim. In his view, I quote McDowell, experience is not to be understood in terms of the idea that sensibility provides something without the form characteristic of thought on which understanding proceeds to impose that form. This statement is at first sight puzzling. For if sensibility does not enable its possessor to think, and so does not provide what thought provides, it must surely contribute to experience, something without the form characteristic of thought. A puzzlement disappears, however, when we consider the following line of reasoning. Experience involves the cooperation of sensibility and understanding. This in turn means that in mature human experience, sensory content is always conceptually informed. If that is the case, however, sensibility cannot provide a content without conceptual form on which understanding proceeds to impose that form. For McDowell then, the notional distinction between sensibility and understanding does not require the latter to give conceptual form to the content yielded by the former. Because in mature human experience, sensory content is never unconceptualized. The Hegel I present in my essay, and the one I've just presented again, thus only has a shaky grip on the insight that matters. On the one hand, he recognizes, like Kant and McDowell, that our conceptual capacities are operative in all sensory experience. But on the other hand, he loses sight of this insight by claiming that, Sensibility does, after all, yield items without the form characteristic of thought, and that our intellectual capacities proceed to work up those deliverances of sensibility into something that has that form. Furthermore, my Hegel does not appear to notice that these two ideas are at odds with one another. McDowell insists against my Hegel that thought and experience does not actively confer the form of objectivity on sensory content that lacks such form, but that, I quote McDowell from Mind and World, conceptual capacities are already operative in the deliverances of sensibility themselves. 
Such capacities for McDowell find their characteristic expression in intellectual activity. But this is not to say, now quoting McDowell, unless we are saying it only as a façon de parler, that experience acquires its objective purport through intellectual activity on our part. In my view, however, Hegel's talk of intellectual activity, both conscious and unconscious, in the constitution of experience is not just a façon de parler. He means what he says, and I quote again what I quoted earlier, intelligence is active in intuition, ist in ihr aktion, for it has shaped, formiert the content of intuition. Moreover, McDowell resists such formulations because I would modestly put it to you in the presence of John here. He misunderstands what they imply. <laughs> McDowell rejects the idea of intellectual activity conferring objectivity on sensory content because he thinks that it imports irresistibly the idea of sensuous content as it was before objectivity was conferred on it. Content that can be found only in an antechamber of the mind. So that's really important. Let me say that again. McDowell's objection to the story that I'm telling and to taking seriously Hegel's language of activity is that that thought imports irresistibly the idea of sensory content as it was before objectivity was conferred on it, content that can be found only in an antechamber of the mind. So taking Hegel's talk of intellectual activity literally thus threatens the insight he shares with Kant. Namely, that we do not first have bare sensations uh, and then work them into conceptual shape. McDowell's concern, however, is unfounded, in my view, because that shared insight is not threatened by the idea that intellectual activity confers objectivity on sensory content. That idea certainly implies that such content could be enjoyed by animals and babies without consciousness of objectivity, but it does not imply that mature human beings first admit sensory content to an antechamber of the mind and then grant it full admittance to consciousness at the cost of being conceptualized. From the view I attribute to Hegel, the sensory content that is a component of perceptual experience is taken up into consciousness and endowed with objectivity as it is first being received. Note that there is only one stage to this process, not two, as McDowell thinks. Similarly, if we see white light through blue glass, and the glass turns the light blue, there is just one event as far as we're concerned, see blue light, even though two different things make contributions to it. Of course, the glass is not active, as thought is on the Hegelian picture of conscious experience, so in that sense the analogy is inappropriate. Nonetheless, it still gives light a color that the light itself does not have, and thereby lets us see only blue light. Just as consciousness gives sensory content a form that it does not have, and in so doing ensures that we experience only conceptualized sensory content. Leaning blue glass to one side, the point for Hegel is that we act on sensory content as we receive it. There are indeed two different things going on, the receiving of that content through sensibility and the acting on it by thought. But these occur together at the same time. Sensory content is thus not just received as it is in the animal, but it is received into consciousness by being actively taken up into it. Our passivity and our activity coincide. In McDowell's story, by contrast, experience involves no activity on the part of the mind, whether conscious or unconscious. Rather, conceptual capacities are drawn into operation passively in the deliverances of sensibility itself. For Hegel, for my Hegel at least, no thought is involved in sensibility as such. But intellectual activity must be involved in perceptual experience, since sensibility does not enable its possessors to think, as McDowell himself admits. And so sensory content itself does not enable us to think of it as objective. Not only, therefore, is sensory content conceptually informed as soon as it is received into the mind, as McDowell puts it, 
but it must be formed conceptually by thought as it is received. McDowell is right that both Hegel and he deny that we first have bare sensations and then bring our powers to the thought to bear on them. Nonetheless, there is a subtle, and the more I talk with John, the more subtle it gets, <laughs> a subtle difference between them. For Hegel highlights the role of intellectual activity and freedom in the constitution of experience, whereas McDowell stresses the passive operation of our conceptual capacities in such constitution, and indeed in sensibility and receptivity itself. Capacities that also find their expression in the activity of making judgments. Assuming that Hegel's talk of intellectual activity and experience is not just a façon de parler. This is a subtle, but I think significant difference between Hegel and McDowell, and one that can perhaps, though this is speculative, be partly explained by McDowell's ignoring the proximity of Hegel to Fichte. Note, by the way, that McDowell also appears to must misunderstand why I invoked the idea of unconscious sensations. The claim made by my Hegel is not as McDowell appears to think, that all sensations are first unconscious and subsequently admitted to consciousness. As I've stressed, the sensory component of perceptual experience is taken into consciousness as it is received and is not first admitted in an unconscious form into an antechamber of the mind. Nonetheless, for Hegel, intelligence is not only activity, but also a nightly pit, a nächtlicher Schacht, in which is stored an infinity of representations without being in consciousness. And Kant, too, talks in the anthropology of representations we have without being aware of them, and in the first critique of intuitions that are nothing for us if not taken up into consciousness. Both Hegel and Kant recognize, therefore, that some of our representations are unconscious. For neither, however, do such unconscious representations enter directly into perceptual experience, though they can become conscious. A further difference between Hegel and McDowell is uh, that for Hegel, ex sensory experience does not take in objects and facts, whereas McDowell, uh, it does, at least it did uh, before <coughs> avoiding the myth of forgiveness. Maybe, maybe it still does, but on, on the text I was working with, it, it, it does. For McDowell, conceptual capacities are operative in our passive sensibility, and so enable us to take in the layout of phenomenal reality in just the way that common sense has it. And I should add here, just as a point of discussion, I think one of the real differences between Hegel and McDowell is that McDowell wants a philosophical account that common sense can live with. And I don't know that that's what motivates Hegel. He's not deliberately picking a fight with common sense. But if the philosophical account deviates from common sense, well, that's fine. For Hegel, by contrast, experience cannot take in objects because objects are, quote, the products of an intellectual construction on our part. We posit what we see as an object. In giving the form of objectivity to sensory content, thought does indeed understand what we see to be the object it is. Yet thought's warrant for doing so lies ultimately within itself, in its inherent knowledge that what it thinks is. As I noted above, this is why Hegel's position, as I presented it, is not one of subjective idealism, as Hegel suggests. In experience, we actively understand what we see to be the object it is, provided the sensory content allows us to. Our experience and the judgments based on it will, however, require revision if the sensory content no longer permits itself to be understood in that way. McDowell thinks this is not good enough and that for my Hegel, experience just doesn't yield knowledge of how things are. Yet this charge holds only if knowledge of how things are must be based on taking in objects and facts and experience. My Hegel, however, does not accept this view of experiential knowledge. Such knowledge for him involves actively understanding and judging things to be what they are. To conclude this paper, let me cite one further remark of McDowell's that highlights the difference, subtle difference, between his position and Hegel's. McDowell writes as follows. 
Holgate attributes to Hegel the idea that our visual and tactile sensations take in directly the look and shape of things. But that cannot be right. It is inconsistent with the basic insight that Hegel shares with Kant. Anything we take in in experience is available to us to be taken in only because our conceptual capacities are operative in the constitution of experience. These lines make it clear that for McDowell, in mature human beings, conceptual capacities are operative in and conditions of sensibility itself. Since this is the case, what we take in in experience can never be anything less than conceptualized sensory content. For Hegel, by contrast, conceptual capacities are not conditions of sensibility for us or for any other animals. In mature human beings, however, the activity of understanding what we see occurs at the same time as the process of seeing, and in that sense is inseparable from it. They join together to form one concrete habit of seeing. There is then a subtle but significant difference between Hegel and McDowell, even though both agree that perceptual experience mediated by understanding is always of conceptualized sensory content or visible objects. McDowell tries to remove this difference by reducing Hegel's talk of intellectual activity and experience to a mere façon de parler. In my view, however, this does not do justice to what Hegel says repeatedly in his texts and lectures. And it interprets away Hegel's core idea that spirit is active in the experience that common sense takes to be merely passive and receptive. Thank you, Professor Holgate. I suppose that John McDowell has something to say about that. Uh, yes. Oh, <coughs> do you want to take this one? No, no, so we can answer to the. Okay. Yeah, but it's better. That also means you can roam around like Big Jagger if you want to, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's on. Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, you know, really nice. And as you say, um, the, the differences become increasingly subtle. Um, uh, but, but let's say something about active. Um, um, I, I tried to debunk that, but um, I don't think everything hangs on that. Um, I'm perfectly happy with locutions like this. We could just leave it with Kant. Forget about Hegel for the moment. Um, it, uh, spontaneity is at work. The spontaneity of the understanding is at work in the constitution of intuitions. That seems like a right thing to say. And what are we to do with that at work? Well, active. Um, <laughs> um, what bothered me about your insistence on activity really was the bit that you now insist uh, wasn't supposed to be an implication of it. Uh, namely that um, the work, the activity, is, um, let me say, working on some raw material. Um, so there has to be in the picture, your, the picture of your Hegel, uh, a raw material on which um, the intelligence, uh, intelligence and thought work, uh, and then the result is uh, perceptual awareness of the objective. Um, and um, I tried to dramatize the horrible thing that I was finding in your Hegel in terms of a first and then, yes. you know, temporal succession. Uh, but now, I, I don't think it works to um, disarm the, the reluctance to accept your line, to say no, it all happens at the same time. Because um, there still is, in the picture of your Hegel, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the right way to frame things, but um, there is sensory content uh, which as such uh, isn't um, of objects. Uh, and and um, the result of the activity is awareness that is of objects. Now I think a way to get at what I think is the residual difference that's still there is to um, keep the discussion going about Luca's paper, um, the, the, the one before. Um, uh, um, the way your Hegel conceives sensory consciousness um, is 
resolutely descriptivist, um, um, something like in opposition to the, the how, how a Hegel who is interpreted on the reconstructivist reading. I should really leave Luca to make this intervention, but since it's going on with the, the debate with me, let me make it, and then he can speak. But it, it's opposed to the reconstructivist understanding. Um, the sensory content as such, when I mean, you have wording like that, that functions in the thinking of your Hegel about perceptual awareness as a layer. Um, uh, um, it's inseparable from uh, inhuman, um, mature human perceptual experience. That layer is inseparable. You don't get in mature human beings uh, things that belong to that layer without. Yeah, that's uh, right. But that's all. You will not allow that um, the rest of what's true about mature human beings makes a difference to the specific sense in which the things that can be said about sensory consciousness, um, sensory content as such, which you know can be said uh, in such a way that generically understood they are true also of uh, non-human animals. I don't know, maybe uh, infants is quite difficult. They haven't even got colored surfaces. Um, but, but anyway, um, yeah, other, other perceivers. Um, it, your Hegel will not allow uh, that they, um, by all means, let's say, activity of intelligence um, makes a difference to the form in which the things that can be said about sensory content as such uh, are to be understood uh, when they are said about uh, um, something that is, in a certain sense, clearly an element in the total truth about mature human perceptual awareness. So I kind of hand over to Luca, but I mean, I think that, that this, insofar as I'm in opposition to you, uh, still, uh, it has to do with uh, um, a thing I can put by saying you are reading Hegel, um, uh, you're reading Hegel's um, treatment of the elements of the story about mature human perceptual awareness in a descriptivist and not a reconstructivist way. So it's very nice how this right, yeah. this issue uh, continues as the issues that Luca raised. Good. Well, first of all, thank you for your response, and thanks also to Luca for your paper, uh, because it set up this debate. Um, yes, and I think actually that I'm glad that that's helpful because it allows me to to say something about method. Because in my question to you, I I think this is you can't resolve this discussion without talking about the method. That, that Hegel is employing. And let me, for the, just, purposes, and this is just for the purposes of this discussion, say something about Kant. As I understand it, Kant begins, if not in the sort of letter of the text, but at least from the idea of a whole of experience. Experience, Kant does not begin literally with, with sensation and intuition. He begins with a whole of experience. And he's dividing up the separating out the elements such that we then understand their distinctive contribution and how they work together. Hegel does not begin like that. The truth comes at the end. The whole is not there at the beginning, it comes at the end. So for me, that means that as we move through any section of Hegel's thinking, we have got to attend to the specifics that we have in front of us. And in some sense, that specific has got to be intelligible on its own through itself. And I think this is true in the logic. You know, The structure of being something in the logic never changes. It's always that. But the various contexts in which it then appears do alter. And so in that broad sense, alter what it is to be something. Turn it into a thing and an object and so on. But to be something is never other than that. Property in the philosophy of right is never other than it is defined in the beginning of the philosophy of right. It's bound up with use and with value and so on. It never becomes anything different, although it can become supported in the context of the administration of justice and the state and history and so on. And I think that's the way Hegel proceeds. So I think that it all depends on what we mean by a full understanding. 
In one sense, John's absolutely right. The full understanding of any given is not there until we have the whole context. But what we are missing is that context within which that X is to be understood. But the context does not alter the structure of what it is to be sensation, consciousness, intuition, language, and thought. Hegel is, in many ways, a disciple of Schiller. And you have to separate out, and then you have to coordinate and, and synchronize. But the distinguishing and the bringing together is absolutely vital. Now, I think in many of, of the formulations that John and I use, this means there is no real difference between us. When it comes to the sort of the, 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 the significant um, the significant difference, I suppose we're both on the side of those people, I suppose, who are with the reconstructivists in, in terms of what we think about perceptual experience. But I think reconstructivism, as you presented it, faces a problem. And the problem is that it seems that as you go through the dialectic, the whole is somehow always kind of hanging over it. It's always a kind of ghostly presence that is being anticipated. And that is the charge that every, well, at least in the tradition I work in, in the continental tradition with Feuerbach, Schelling, Heidegger, that's the charge everybody wakes against Hegel. And I want to argue that it's wrong, that there is nothing being anticipated at all. We're just focused on what we've got. So, so I'm forced, in a way, to adopt a form of your descriptivism, whilst acknowledging the reconstructivist view that the truth is the whole in which all these moments are one. I think John's exactly right that it all depends on what happens to those moments. And my own understanding is that the moments themselves don't change in their structure. The context change changes, the oval significance of them changes. But what Hegel's saying, when he's discussing sensation about uh, light and sound, it seems to me that it never becomes, even in concrete, so even now, if we were, as it were, to analyze out what it is we're actually seeing, we're seeing colors. We're not seeing objects. In a more developed sense, a concrete habit of seeing. The seeing that we learn to do, of course we're seeing objects. But then when you ask, well, what's that, as it were, a unity of? What are the different moments a unity of? Such that their differences are not lost in their identity. Then you've got to draw those distinctions. So, now, some of these issues, if you're not interested in Hegel, won't worry you. But for me, there's a heck of a lot that hangs on this, and it has to do with the method, Hegel's thinking. It has to do with the extent to which difference is preserved in identity. Um, and it has to do also, if, if what John is saying is right about sensation, then for me, it's got to be right about property. It's got to be right about being. And I don't find that to be the case. I don't find... For example, the notion of immediacy in the logic. The notion of immediacy is allied with being, and it's always allied with being. Being is never anything other than immediacy. It comes to be mediated immediacy, but it's still mediated immediacy. Um, and so, by analogy, sensation, it seems to me, has those characteristics. But I say this is a subtle and distinct, uh, and, and, and a subtle distinction. I think what it's got to do, and if I'm sorry, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I wanted to highlight something that John didn't highlight, which is that if John is, in John's position as I understand it, the conceptual capacities are operative in sensibility. And so they are operative, they're passively drawn into operation. And so they let us take in something. And that used to be called conceptual content. I, I, and I think that is a very different perspective. The implication of Hegel's view is that, that thought, doesn't, thought doesn't take in. Thought posits, and in that sense, I'm close to Tom. But what it posits is what it knows to be there. And that's what Kantians find completely baffling. They think, what are you talking about? Thought surely just entertains possibility. Being has to be given. No, Hegel says not at all. Thought is, from within itself, the thinking of being. And so no passivity is needed to, as it were, take in conceptual content. The conceptual fabric of the world is thought by us actively as what it is. And I think this is a difference in emphasis. Maybe that could even go at some point. I mean, you know, 
let me say, I'm not interested in driving a wedge between the two. I'm trying to get clear in my mind what the difference is. So, sorry, that was a long answer um, to your question, but uh, I hope it helps. I might just be dramatizing uh, what John already said um, at one remove from Hegel, and I think that maybe it, I think that John's account actually tries to take care of the Kantian worry and make us understand what, what Hegel might say. So okay. it seems to me that the descriptive reading, or that if I want to charge you with the descriptive reading, what you're saying is that um, in some sense there are um, sensations for um, Hegel, and then thought operates on these sensations when they come in and posits. Well, sensory content, maybe, but there's sensory content there that's all right. on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that is um, independently intelligible of thought itself. Not separable, but 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 it can be I mean, under you you, Yes, independently intelligible, but not yes. separable. Okay, then. Okay. It can't be, it's not independent. It can't occur as separate. And you also say that um, the only thing that ever enters self-consciousness is, uh, is thoughts of thought. And self consciousness are in some sense the same thing, right? <coughs> well, and sensory content. Sensory content enters consciousness. Sensory by being by being conceptualized actively, right? Yes, so yes, that's right. right. Yes, yes. Okay, and then Hegel says that um, philosophy is thought thinking itself, right? So I wonder what, from the standpoint of philosophy, right, which is thoughts, self consciousness, entitles us to talk about sensations that we never are aware of. It's a, that is a posit as well, right? Sort of a theoretical posit. It, it never really figures in oh, I see. in, in self-consciousness. And I think this is the worry, yeah. that there is some oh, sort of yes. super sensible positive that might, so, and then you say that it's habit that does the conceptualization. But why can our habit be completely wrong? Or why can't okay. there be some this evolution gives us uh, other rational beings that have completely different habits or okay. something. All right, this so gets us to, yes, I understand. Um, and I'm not sure you're going to like this answer, but, but can I say one more thing? Oh, yeah, sorry, yes. I, I think just need to remember my answer to that so question. The, so the, um, the merit of the reconstructive reading is that it starts from thought, thinking thought, and works itself uh, out, if that's already problematic, but works itself out of self-consciousness to entitle itself um, to make these claims maybe about sensations, about objects that are in the world. Right. Okay. I think let's leave the phenomenology to one side for a minute. Um, not that I think it's not relevant to these debates, but, but I'm interested in Hegel's account in, in the philosophy of subject spirit. And focus on Hegel's logic and his philosophy, so we will hold. First of all, let me just state the obvious. Hegel's not an empiricist. Similarly, he's not a phenomenologist in the sense in which we're used to from Rousseau from and Melville Ponty. He is a card-carrying, paid-up member of the a priori philosoph philosophizing club. And Alistair Stone, who was referred to, for example, recognizes that. So what this means is that in the logic, Hegel takes himself to be unfolding the categories that are inherent in and necessary to thought. These are also the categories that are inherent in and necessarily belong to being, as I want to say. This continues through the philosophy of nature, and it continues into the philosophy of spirit. So why does Hegel identify these different stages of cognition? It is because the necessity of thought requires him to. And particularly, what he's interested in is in, in those early set sections um, uh, of, this, of the anthropology is in the way in which subjectivity gains a degree of freedom in its naturalness. Now, I therefore, what for me, I'm not of the belief, I'm not, I'm, you know, Hegel's open to anyone, but I think there is a price to pay if you don't attend to Hegel's method and what he is doing. And if one thinks, you know, like Alan Wood does, that you can just lift out propositions uh, and forget the logic. I think that's a problem, and, and it's, it's, it's Hegel's logic, ultimately, which is the answer to your question. You're absolutely right. Hegel can't just introspect and somehow say, oh yeah, there's a bit of sensation. He can provide confirmation in a way that I think we all can, in a sense, well, I certainly can, you know, I'm short-sighted to, to begin with, uh, but if you sort of let your eyes go out of focus, you just kind of get, you know, I can get pretty much a kind of blank uh, plane of colors, but that's no grounds for philosophy. Philosophy 
works through a, a logical derivation of the fundamental shapes of spirit. And I think this follows Fichte in many ways, the derivation of the basic acts of the mind. And it's what Hegel thought Kant should have done, because Kant's no more empiricist or phenomenological than Hegel is. So that's the answer why. Now, could they have been different? Well, that depends on what you take Hegel's logic to achieve. If you take history and evolution to be primary, and any a priori philosophizing goes on in the context of that, then no. By definition, there is nothing that is able to be definitively true at this point in time. A lot of people take that view. I don't. I think it's the other way around. I think for Hegel, being is primary, and the necessities inherent in being and the logos are primary, and they in turn generate and explain history. Uh, well, he didn't have very good ideas about evolution, but that's, you know, he, didn't, he had a different conception of what it was. In that sense, it seems to me he's much closer to Spinoza. Um, you know, and, and just as Spinoza is able to derive emotions, one of which doesn't have a name. Spinoza, there must be an emotion. I don't know what the name is, because there isn't one. But there must be an emotion. I think, too, Hegel is providing this derivation, which gets confirmation, he thinks, from experience, but it's not derived from it. Now, of course, the non-Hegelians, and those who don't like Spinoza, are going to find this is rubbish of no use to you. But what I'm trying to suggest is you can't avoid it if you want to understand what Hegel's uh, getting at. So I, I, that would be my response. I don't know whether that is helpful to you. But it's not pulled out of the airwaves. It's not based on empiricism. It's not based on phenomenological disclosure. And it's not just based on the contingencies of history. Although I understand why certain critics, Marx, for example, thinks that Hegel's philosophy is guilty in that respect. So we have um, the last question. Very good statement. I think it's a uh, very interesting, well-crafted paper. Um, I have a question about page five. Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> about, <laughs> about what actually, hang on, because I think because you know I have to print mine out, so there's virtually one letter of page, so I can read it. So you could you identify more precisely what, um, what you say about, uh, about what you take to be Hegel's misunderstanding of Kant's conception of the thing in itself. Ah, yes. Okie dokie. Uh, I was surprised by what I take to be an extreme form of constructionism on your part. Uh, I'd like to know exactly what you mean. You say that Hegel takes Kant's concept to refer to what things really are in themselves. That is, he conflates the thing in itself with being. And then yes. you say, this is a misunderstanding because Kant's concepts does not refer to some being just out of reach, but, but is produced by thought as the correlate of the idea that objects of experience are appearances. But if objects, Kant says different things. He says objects are appearances and objects are representations. Now, I take it that one can't uh, scan the, Kant is inconsistent with that perspective. But if you say that the table is an appearance, then you commit yourself to the idea that there's something of which it appears. Yes. Uh, yes. But that which appears is not constructed in virtue of the fact that there's an appearance, but the appearance is constructed on the basis of the other way around. No. Yeah. No. Yes. But, well, okay. Well, well, in Kant, I think it's the other way around. Oh, no. yes. uh, you yeah, absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, yes, and I think, uh, and I should explain why I have, have come to this view, uh, because I, I, I suppose before I encountered serious Kantians, you know, among you know Henry Allison and and, uh, and Robert Pippin and Paul Geyer and others, I had the naive Hegelian view that Hegel was right about Kant, um, and, and I had to give up on that and, and basically think, well, no, he's not, and he's not right about Spinoza either. There's a lot of things he's not right about. However, it seems to me there is something very important in Hegel's critique of Kant. So, 
Um, okay, so what, what my current view on Kant is, is as follows, that or no, Hegel's understanding is that, as it were, there is a reality out there. Kant thinks that we are somehow confined within subjective structures. Ergo, we fall short of the reality that is out there, and that is why we're confined within a subjective idealism. And that sounds all fine and dandy, until you then think, well, actually, I don't think that's right. Kant doesn't start with the reality that's out there in some sort of remote sense. What Kant starts with is experience and the objects of experience may be governed by the laws of Newtonian science. And hey, Kant's question is, how is it possible for us to have a, pri a priori knowledge of such objects? And his answer is through a priori forms of intuition and a priori categories. Fine, that's fine. However, Kant draws a further and so a further consequence for that, and that is that if the forms of intuition are subjective, therefore they cannot be objective in any really strong sense. And this is just assumed by Kant; it's never argued for. And of course, there is a corollary of that. If what comes from the subject can't be true or apply to something in any strongly objective sense, how would we get any knowledge of what is, as it were, strongly objective? We could only get it from those things. So for Kant, you can only know of things themselves from things themselves. And he says that paragraph nine of the Prolegomena, absolutely clearly. Now, of course, he doesn't think we have knowledge of things in themselves anyway, so that's an irrelevance. Nonetheless, it means that there is a restriction inherent in the very idea of the a priori. That means that the objects of experience are appearances. So appearances come first. And the, these things that we're looking at are appearances by virtue of the fact that the forms of intuition through which they're in space and time are subjective and a priori. But then what you say is right. If they are appearances, we need a corresponding concept of the thing in itself. We need it for two reasons. On the one hand, to limit the application of the forms of, of, of intuition, and on the other hand, to be the transcendental object that causes the sensations that we have. But in both cases, that thought is thought by understanding. And that's why I gave you that passage. Understanding makes for itself the thought that. And I don't think Hegel really understands any of this. I think Hegel misses all of this. But does that mean that Hegel's whole critique of Kant's understanding of thought is wrong? No, because elsewhere, in the critique of the ontological argument, Kant does indeed distinguish thought and being, and he does it in the third critique. So the idea that thought is not a form of intellectual intuition, and that's Hegel's charge, if not in those words, I think that is right. So. And you might think, well, why the heck am I worrying about it? I'm worrying about this because I don't want people like Henry Allison sort of dumping on, on what I'm trying to say about Hegel for that reason. So why not, why not present my, a Kant as strongly as I can? And I do think that that Kant is what Kant's about and that Hegel misrepresents that. That's sure. my view. Well, but isn't, isn't there a difference between the order of, of the arguments and the order of the But it can't be an ontological claim, that's the point, because ontological claim, an ontolo you know, the ontology, what is it, the proud name of ontology, gives way to that of an analytic of understanding. Ontology is not about things in themselves. That, that was in the inaugural dissertation and in Kant's early texts, absolutely. But I think ontology is restricted by Kant uh, to uh, that realm of objects under the categories. <coughs> so it's not, but things aren't, as it were, ontological. Yes, but how could that be Well, that's that's the second analogy. That has nothing to do with things themselves. That's that's the analogies that that that, that for Hume you can have an objective sequence of events 
on which then the habit of causal making causal judgment builds. Kant's argument, as you know, is that you could never have that objective sequence of events in the first place without the concept of cause. It's only because you know that this is caused to be in a certain temporal relation to that that you can have any conception of, of a temporal sequence at all. So Hume's answered without reference to things in themselves. I would say. Sorry, I'm going to have to shut down. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, we are almost one hour late, and we have some problem with the checkout at the hotel. So uh, they don't want to uh, wait for us. So uh, our suggestion is to go now to the hotel, do the checkout, bring the luggage here. And then since the second uh, panel session had, had been canceled, the two uh, speakers who uh, should speak now would speak in the second section uh, in the afternoons. The section ends at uh, um, 4 p.m. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and now. <laughs> and at 5 o'clock, we are already here with our luggage and we can go to the oral grade. So thank you, everybody, for uh, <laughs> your questions and attention. And I, and I have to say, just thank John, because without John's work, none of this would be happening. So uh, thank you.